I don't think I'll spend any time talking about my own background except just to say that uh, I spent a lot of time as a minister, a pastor, Southern Baptist, and uh, went through a period of anger and rebellion, had a fight with God that lasted about five years, and then I found out that uh, um, God and I could get along absolutely beautifully once I quit demanding that he be Southern Baptist. Um, I found out that uh, God doesn't even have an ego problem. She doesn't even mind when you call her him. And when I began to see a new source in a new way, it became much easier to relate and, and to work with. And I also found that, that it's not so unbelievable that these ancient prophets could really talk to God. I think it's very possible that the source of our mind is perfectly capable of communicating with our mind. After all, she invented communication. She probably knows how to talk and how to listen. And when we begin to get this kind of two-way communication going, life becomes considerably simpler and easier. And really, probably the most important thing that I discovered is that my relationship with God depended upon my relationship with myself. For all of the time that I didn't like me, felt inadequate and guilty and sinful and all of those things, I found that God agreed with me. And when I found out that it's all right for me to make mistakes, I began to discover that it's all right with God, too. I'm going to keep coming back to that all day today because it's really the only message that I've got to say to anybody anywhere. I think the rest of the things pretty much take care of themselves when you settle that. Whether we're talking about emotions or communications, about spiritual growth or about relationships, in fact, even if we're talking about health, the key comes back to your relationship with yourself. All other relationships are made out of it. We can say that your prime relationship is with self and your second relationship is with God or your source, whatever you consider that to be. Um, you can use any term for that. Higher mind, the source of your mind, the creative source of mind and body. This is your second prime relationship. And the reason that I put it second instead of first is because it is dependent upon the first one. You will naturally build your relationship with God based upon your feeling about yourself. This is the first relationship to heal, and that healing of this relationship must be maintained. Every time this relationship gets out of kilter, everything else in life gets out of kilter. When the relationship with yourself is not whole, you will begin blaming other people. And the interesting thing is, all of the things that you say about your relationships with other people are very credible. Um, for example, if I'm counseling with a battered wife, there's no denying that she's been hit. I mean, she's got the bruises. And there's no denying that that hurts. There's no denying that that's a problem. And, you know, the temptation is to work on this guy who's battering her. But more basic is her putting herself in a particular position and feeling the need for what she's experiencing. When she gets whole, he is going to have to change. In any kind of a situation like that, where a person is being a victim, you need to look at why we're making ourselves a victim, why we train people to treat us the way that we get treated. And we get distracted from causes to results. The situations that we find ourselves in are results. In fact, there's, a, there's an interesting study that you should know about that relates to this. Um, the police authorities have discovered that a person who is a victim of a crime is not likely to be a victim just once. They'll be a victim again and again and again and again until that victim changes. And what we focus on, of course, is punishing the criminal, but there is no help for the victim. If victims of crime could learn 
to see themselves in a different way, to change their habits, to change what they expect from life, we would have less crime. And of course, on the other side of that, if instead of punishing criminals, our penal institutions were institutions for teaching people self-love and self-respect, then we would have some effectiveness in fighting crime. I mean, consider this. Happy people don't commit crimes. And what do we do to criminals? We make them unhappier. We almost guarantee more crime by our whole system that we're living with now. There are so many things that are absolutely, exactly backwards in the system that we need to do a major turnaround in our whole culture, our beliefs about each other. You and I grew up in an irrational culture that taught you some things that are not true. And if you want to make your life effective and make it work, you're going to have to examine a whole set of beliefs that you and I grew up with. Um, beliefs, for example, that the appropriate thing to do with unkindness is return unkindness. Evil for evil. It's a basic thing of our culture, and in fact, it's called standing up for yourself. In fact, it's even linked to self-worth and, and pride. But it really has nothing to do with self-worth and pride. It has to do with being out of control. It has to do with blaming somebody else as if you are a victim and other people are responsible for how you feel. Basically, if we could get children to begin to believe from a very early age that they are wonderful, all right people, they are loved, and they are responsible for that. I am loved, and it is my responsibility to remember. I have love. I can give it to myself. I do not need your worth. I want it. And it's all right to want it. It's all right to accept it. It's all right to make contracts between you and me to give love and all rightness to one another. But the moment I step across that line from want to need and say it is your responsibility, I mean, after all, we're married, it's your responsibility to love me, the law says you're supposed to. I mean, for what? What good does it do to make legal contracts to make another person feel something that they don't feel, something that perhaps they used to feel and they've changed their mind? Now what use is the contract? You can't legislate it. If instead... I can bind you to me, not with a legal contract, but by making myself something that you want to be with, then I can feed a relationship and make it grow. We've grown up believing that it is the responsibility of other people to give me my all rightness and to seek that throughout life, trying to impress people trying to get people's attention, trying to get my worth by getting people to give it to me. And there are a whole series of other things. But in essence, it keeps coming back to this right relationship with self, then right relationship with source. Right relationship with source is so that I have the, the instruction, the communication that I need. If I'm all right with the source of my mind, I can listen. I can listen with more of my mind than rational, logical thought. Um, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about there. We've taught our children in this culture, and we continue to, even right now. Your children are being taught this. They're taught that thinking is a matter of using five external senses to make observations of the world around you, and that as you make these observations, you store them, make comparisons, and draw conclusions. Now, that's fine. It's true. Except there's a problem with it. That is done with half of your brain. There's another half of your brain, and the other half of your brain thinks a different way, a totally different way. Your children are not taught this. It isn't taught in very many places right now, but it's observable. It's true. You can find it out for yourself. The other half of the brain think by wondering and by listening. In fact, in ancient times, the whole process of thought was thought to be that. Before Aristotle delineated the, uh, the system for logical thought, thinking was thought to be a process like this. There are gods, intelligent beings who know the answers, and the process of thought is discovering a question. 
and becoming quiet and listening for an answer, and new discoveries, whenever they ca came, were thought to come from God. And a person gave thanks for their realization. So thinking was thought to be a conversation between self and a source. Aristotle came along and said, that's not what happens. You use the senses, make observations, draw conclusions. That's logical thinking. And ever since Aristotle delineated that, people have been saying, especially educators, that's the only way to think. Aristotle didn't say that. But you know what happens when the teacher dies, the students take over, and then it all of a sudden it becomes dogma. This is the only way. And we've been doing that for a couple of thousand years now. And you know what it does? Here's a child growing up with a natural ability to be imaginative and intuitive, discovering things inside himself. And he comes along to an adult, and he tells this adult some beautiful, exciting new thing that he just found out, which the adult didn't know. And the adult says, how do you know? That's what adults always say to children when they say some wonderful thing that they've just discovered. How do you know? And if that child can say, I saw it with my own eyes, I heard it with my own ears, I touched it with my own fingers, then the adult is likely to believe him. But if the child says, well, I just knew it inside me, or even worse, if he says, a bunny rabbit told me, the adult is going to say, that's just your imagination. And that phrase, just your imagination, effectively teaches that child that source of information is not valid. And the child is then taught to throw away half his brain, put that on hold. Imagination is for entertainment. It is not for getting information. And he takes the whole uh, left hemisphere of his brain and sets it aside, throws it away, and doesn't use it. And the child is effectively taught to function for the rest of his life as a half-wit. using half the brain for this. You've got a whole brain, and one hemisphere of that brain is used for an intuitive, imaginative, creative process. It has five senses of its own that are subtler senses. They can take in information, they can communicate, they can listen. There is a whole process of thought that happens there, but it happens in the quiet. And the process of thought with that half of the brain is a process of learning to wonder and then shut up and listen. Of course, when you're an adult, you have learned the rational logical system so well that the hardest thing in the world for you to do is shut up. Very difficult to do nothing for an adult. It's much more important for children to learn this process as children and to learn. It is not that one side of the brain is more effective than the other. I wouldn't want children to switch over and become psychics instead of log logical thinkers. But the idea is to use one side of the brain to balance the other. I should find out what I can learn about a process intellectually and then I should find out what I can learn about that same process intuitively. And when I've used both sides of my mind, I will understand the process on two different levels, an inner level and outer level, intuitive feeling and intelligent feeling or logical feeling. And putting those together, I get a whole. And my world becomes something else. And then I discover something else, too. If our relationship with the world depends on logical, rational thought, then our point of reference for that is external physical senses. And that means a definition of reality that is based on materiality, which most of us have. In fact, it creeps into our conversation when we talk about uh, reality. When I say the real world, there is an assumption that I mean this solid world around us. And then when I close my eyes and step into a meadow like we did last night, we say, that's not the real world, that's the imaginative world. It isn't real. Well, you know what's interesting? Real is what is affecting you at a moment. When you are in that meadow, and you're experiencing that matter, you're feeling the grass, you're smelling the air, you're feeling the sunlight on your skin, you're listening to the water. If you spend time in that meadow and it becomes your prime reality for a little while, 
The interesting thing about this solid matter reality where you left your body is it is effectively a memory. It's not your real world in the moment. The real world is the one that you're functioning in. And what I'm really saying is reality is bigger than matter. The reality that you and I can experience in this moment with our eyes, our external senses, is very small. It's limited to the walls of this room. You and I both know there's more to reality that I'm experiencing with these external senses. And if I want to sense the, the sound out there, is that the sound? The water out there? If I want to be aware of that right now, I'm going to have to extend subtler senses. I can see it right now. I can see the Wainwright house. I can see the structure over there. But in order to do that, I have to use subtler senses. I extend my consciousness to be aware of a greater reality than my physical being is experiencing at the moment. Now, by that same process, we can go into subtler realities. The importance of subtler realities is that this reality, our perception of this reality, is a result of those subtler realities, which means something like this. If the subtler inner realities are frightening, terrifying to you, this world will also be. If, on the other hand, I can spend a great deal of my time in the inner reality, in a beautiful, supportive place, feeling good about it, then I'll open my eyes and experience this physical reality in a different kind of way, with a greater confidence, with greater awareness of what's going on around me. If I can use both sides of my senses, both sides of my brain, I will experience the world in a whole different kind of way. Learn to use your whole consciousness to be all right with that and to know that you are more than just a physical sensory being. And as you do that, get in touch with the source of your mind by talking with it, by asking questions, listening for answers. And you'll, you'll discover something about this inner source. It is not just an imaginative thing that you get answers inside yourself, but you can get answers in the world around you too. This source of yours can answer you in the most amazing ways. One thing that you should probably learn about life is that it's a sort of a setup, meaning that everybody else here works for your teacher, your inner teacher, this source. This source of yours, this inner self, appears to me to be a teacher who wants you to learn about your strengths and your weaknesses. Now, the interesting thing about this inner teacher is he knows every weakness that you have, and he is determined to make you overcome those weaknesses. So he takes all of your weaknesses and he whispers them into the ears of all of the people that you have to work around. And they keep putting out little things to you. They know every frustration that you can meet, and your teacher keeps prompting them, giving them that one, you know? It's a setup. All these people work for your teacher. Your husband, your wife works for your teacher. You may as well realize. And if you want to get in touch with that teacher, watch what's happening around you. Watch the way that other people are relating to you. You can learn the things that set you off. You can learn your weaknesses by watching what other people do to you and what it causes you to feel. You get to know yourself by realizing how easy it is, perhaps, for other people to change your mood, your emotion, your body chemistry. How vulnerable am I to other people? And instead of learning from that how many people around you are frustrating people, what you should learn about that is how easily I'm frustrated. And those are opposite sides of the coin. When we begin to look at it from that opposite direction, taking personal responsibility is what self-love is all about. It's not just a pretty thing that makes me feel better about myself. What it really does is force me to take responsibility for myself. If I'm going to love and respect myself, I'm going to realize I am responsible for my emotions, for my communication, for the way that I feel at all times. And it takes a person from a posture of a victim to a master. In fact, there's philosophy that I have about this planet that I think I should share with you. 
If you look at this planet, if you observe the way that it runs, what you'll find is everything runs on a cause-effect basis. Everything that happens is an effect, and there is a cause behind it. Now, if that's true, cause-effect relationships run this planet, then the smartest thing to do in coming on this planet is learn what all the right causes are. If you learn all the right causes, then you produce all the right effects. A person who produces the right effects is an effective person. In fact, a person who learns all the causes and all the effects would be called a master. You master the laws of the planet. I think I know why you're here. I think you looked at this planet from another perspective and you saw all these cause-effect relationships and you said, oh, that's simple. I'm going to go down there and produce all the right causes. You were ridiculously ambitious when you came here. You intended to become a master. I really believe that. I don't think there's any other reason for incarnating on this planet than to become a master. And you know what's fascinating about that? If you told somebody, you tell anybody, I came here to be a master, they're going to say, uh-huh. I mean, we're not supposed to think that way. We're supposed to deny our purpose for being on this planet. It's ridiculous to assume that I could master this planet, isn't it? Well, I came here for that purpose. Why is it ridiculous to assume that I can do what I came to do? We need to change our whole idea about who we are and what we are and what we can accomplish. We came here to master the laws of this planet. It is possible. It's not only possible. It's our responsibility. It's what we came for. And we can waste time or we can get on with it. We can start being effective now. And it isn't quite as difficult as we seem to make it. If I will begin to take responsibility for me immediately, number one, I need love. And that's my responsibility and how easy it is. I can get love any time I want it. I'm the source of love. Now, I can go through what people go through all the time. It's the most popular thing in the world, feeling unloved and putting out the messages, will you give me some sympathy? Will you give me some attention? Will you give me some anger, if nothing else? You know, I'm going to make sure that you notice me because I need love. And we put out all these things, trying to manip manipulate all the other people around us to get our need, when it is so simple to sit down and say, I am a source of love. I love me. I can give me what I need to feel good. Next time you start feeling alone, unloved, and people around you are not appreciating you, kick yourself in the pants and say, that's my responsibility, and I'll take care of it right now. Now, it might not be what you want to do in the situation, because we have a habit. We have built habits, and these habits usually don't work for us. Now, if it doesn't work for you, and it doesn't, now really examine that one, it doesn't work for you, because when you start putting out this message of need for love, you do two things. One is you invite rejection, and two is even if you get it, you have taught the other person your vulnerability. They have given you something that makes you all right, and now there's an imbalance. You owe them something, and you begin this manipulation back and forth. In any case, the healthiest thing for you to do is establish your own all rightness and your own love for yourself. Now, if you still want to share love with another person, which you will, share it not from a need not from an emptiness, not from a vacuum, but from being all right. And it's a beautiful experience. Do you know how easy it is to love an all right person? Do you know what a pleasure it is? Then instead of leeching on a relationship, you are giving to a relationship. And you don't beg for love. You don't plead for love. You don't manipulate for love. You give it, and it comes naturally because you're a supportive person coming from a supportive place. You are giving to the person that you want to receive from. You allow them to give instead of obligating them to give. When you can have that kind of self-love, you'll have a pride that doesn't need to stand up for itself. I don't have to defend myself, stand up for me, stand against you as if we were competing. I am all right. 
and it's all right if you're not all right. I'm going to recognize your all rightness because I know something about you. You were born with it. It's there. Even if you don't know it, it's there. And I can know it even when you don't. And from that space, I can begin to experience a supportive relationship with you and allow you to grow into your own all rightness. Um, the third relationship in order of importance, in my opinion, is a relationship with parents. And the reason that I put this one here is because it has such an enormous effect on all the rest. In fact, it even could go bev before your relationship with God because chances are the way that you build your relationship with God will depend upon the relationship you had with your parents and authority figures in growing up. If you, well, this is so common, I may as well assume that you did. You probably spent most of your life trying to please your parents. Now, if your parents loved themselves, which they probably didn't, it's almost universal. Do you realize how pervasive this is? There are darn few parents who love themselves. And the interesting thing is, because they don't love themselves, they try to make their children into surrogate selves. All of the guilt and inadequacies that I feel, I do one of two things. I either try to get you to be a perfect little thing that makes up for my inadequacies, or, because I feel so inadequate, I try to suppress you and keep you from ever feeling good about yourself because you can't be better than me. So parents do one of two things. They either try to make their children into some perfect beings. They make demands on them, incredible demands, pushing them way beyond their limits and making them feel pressured, or they put them down. They build them up too much or they put them down. And both of those are based on the parent's sense of inadequacy. And what happens is that almost all of the men that I work with in counseling are still, I mean 40 years later, still trying to impress their fathers. Their father may be dead, but they're still trying to impress him. The way that they relate to other men is what the message is that they want to get across to their father. Trying to prove their masculinity, trying to prove their all rightness, trying to live up to their father's expectations. Now the interesting thing is most men feel accepted by their mothers. And women feel accepted by their fathers but are competing with their mothers. Forty years later they're still trying to please their mother. And they remember how hard it was to try to please her and their own sense of inadequacy comes from her communication of not all rightness. They never lived up to her expectation. And they suffer 50 years later. And their suffering is taken out on all other women. And men's suffering is taken out on all other men. Now that's not universal, those two. Sometimes that's reversed. There are men who didn't please their mother and there are women who didn't please their father. But in any case, almost all of us have this continuing relationship with our parents even after they die. Other people begin to play their role and we begin to relate to other people as if they were our parents. If you can end your karma with your parents right now. Your relationship with bosses, with older people, will end. And you will begin to relate with, to them, with them, with confidence and a feeling of all rightness. And you change your relationship with your parents. You can begin to relate with them as mature adult people talking to mature adult people had an interesting incident a few weeks ago. There was a young man who did a workshop with us and learned something about his own all rightness. And for 30 years, he has been fighting with his father. His father has been abusing him, gets into an absolute rage. Now, this father is a very successful man. He's an attorney, has a lot of money, does a lot of things with stocks and bonds, and, and is passing on an inheritance to all of these children, which, of course, is used as a device to keep them in line. And this young man has been successful in his own right. He's made an enormous amount of money, which helped him a little bit in his all rightness. But still, his father would come down on him and yell and scream. They ran into a family relationship in which 
his brother is asking for a loan from his father, $100,000 he wanted to borrow. And so the father says, well, who are the other partners in this thing that you're going to do? And he says, well, that's confidential. And the father goes off in a puff of steam. What are you, crazy? You stupid idiot. You're asking me to borrow $100,000 and you think that I'm not going to know who these other partners are? You're stupid. And he begins to use all of these, these terms. So the brother, the one that we were counseling with, hears all of that and he says, that's not right. And he goes in to encounter his father and he says, I think that you should apologize to my brother. And the father says, you shut up and sit down. He says, no, I won't shut up and sit down. I think you owe him some respect. He's another individual. He is an adult. And whether he was right or whether he's wrong, you don't have a right to use these abusive terms. Then the father becomes abusive toward him. He says, I'm your father. Sit down. Shut up. And the young man said to him something that I think was absolutely appropriate in the situation. He said, this isn't a father-son relationship. He said, you're a man and I'm a man, six inches taller than you. Now you sit down. <laughs> and suddenly there was a role reversal that had waited years and years and years in happening. But he had a respect for himself, still had a respect for his father, and they learned to communicate in a whole different kind of way. He stopped seeing himself in this subordinate role, and his father gained a respect for him. It isn't necessary to have these clashes. It isn't necessary to have this manipulation. But until I feel all right about me, I can't come from a space of saying, no, this isn't a father-son relationship. I'm another individual. I'm an adult. I am me. You are you. We communicate. Your ideas are good. I want to know what you think. But I don't recognize these obligations to maintain postures that don't work for me in relationships. When is the day when you m maintain an equality with authority figures and realize that your counsel, your wisdom is valid too? When is the day when your father can come to you and ask for advice and to listen like a son. It's very appropriate to reverse those roles sometimes. And if you can't reverse those roles, you don't have a right relationship with your parents. They don't have a right relationship with you. And if they find it impossible to reverse roles with you, they aren't all right with themselves. They have a problem with their own self-worth. You need to gain your own worth. And if you can communicate the worth of your parents, if they can be all right enough to sit down and listen and reverse roles with you, then you're going to have a beautiful relationship with your parents. But the interesting thing is, having a right relationship with your parents does not require that they have a right relationship with you. This is an individual matter. You can have a right relationship with any other person, even if that other person doesn't have a right relationship with you. This is a personal responsibility. It happens within you. And it happens through a right relationship with self-worth. I am all right. And in fact, it is the role of a healer with patients. You may as well realize that this planet is a hospital populated and run by the patients. Every once in a while, somebody becomes a healer. A healer is a person who can recognize symptoms in patients and can respond to them. Now, another patient, as long as you're playing the other patient role, you're a person who is hurt by the symptoms and catches the disease. Now, how quickly do you catch the disease when somebody becomes angry? What do you think the appropriate response is to anger, to get angry too? then you have a communicable disease. It has been communicated to you. You have been infected by what was going on. How about if you can see a negative reaction on another person's part, and instead of being infected by it, instead of making it a communicable disease, stop and think, that's a symptom. Instead of hating a person for their symptoms, instead of resenting their symptoms, is that appropriate response on the part of a healer? I mean, I say to you, you're not all right, you're being jealous, you're being angry, you're being hurt, you're being depressed, and you shouldn't do that. 
Well, any patient knows that he had, shouldn't have his symptoms, but is that appropriate for a doctor to say to a patient, you've got symptoms, and you're just going to have to get over it if you want a relationship with me? That's not what a healer does. A healer recognizes symptoms as symptoms and still loves the patient. The patient is still all right. And what I want to do is give a dose of medicine that can heal that symptom. And the interesting thing is, it may make it worse first. After all, when you become all right with yourself, that's very disturbing to all of the people who have built their relationship on your lack of all rightness. Chances are, if you're not all right with yourself, the people that you are closest to have felt safe building a relationship with you because you were not all right with yourself. That's the very thing that made them love you. Now, supposing you get well. You've taken away the thing that made it safe for them to relate to you. It's frightening. It'll be frightening to your husband. It'll be frightening to your wife, your children, your boss, your co-workers. When you get all right with yourself, people around you are going to be upset. And you may as well know that in advance. It's going to be more challenging for a little while. If you maintain that all rightness, they will very soon see a difference in it. I had an experience last week that confirmed this so well to me. I'd like to share it with you. It's an extremely emotional experience for me. I can't tell you how much it affected me. I grew up in this religious home. My father was a Southern Baptist minister, too. And so we grew up with God at the dinner table at every meal. And um, when we got up in the morning, when we went to bed at night, and the only thing that was ever discussed in our house really was things about religion and God and getting people saved and so on. And somehow I tolerated that reasonably well, produced enormous feelings of guilt in me, but not an awful lot of resentment except for a little while. My older brother didn't respond that way. My older brother would say to you right now, well, I can't really repeat this. Um, when people at work mention God to him, um, he just rejects all of that. And then they say, well, you're an atheist. And he says, no, I'm not an atheist. It's not that I don't believe in God. I just don't give a damn. He can be there if he wants to. Only he doesn't say damn. He goes a little, well, anyway, I just don't care if he's there or not. That's his attitude. And so he's gone through all of these years and years of hating religion. I mean, with, I mean, a venomous hate. He doesn't want to be around my father because he's going to talk about somebody being gloriously saved last week and my brother will just get oh, knotted up inside. And he feels guilty about that. He wants to be around dad, but he wants to be away from him when he starts talking and all this stuff is, is going on. So he's driven to be successful. He's mayor of a, of a southern city and he's very proud of his... Uh, of being a city commissioner and then finally being mayor and driving his Cadillac and having his all of these things. That's what he's built his life on. In the last few years, I've spent a little time with him for the first time in my life. We were never together growing up, um, had absolutely nothing in common. I never really knew him, and I didn't know that I didn't know him until a few months ago. And we got together and we talked. We spent some time together. We went to Europe together two years ago, and then we went on a vacation together in Hawaii just last year. Now, that's the most in 40 years that we've ever done together, those couple of weeks. And just a week ago, my brother called me up, and he said, um, he said, I don't know how to tell you this, but he said, I want to come and spend some time with you. He said, you've got something I want. And... To hear this coming from him, for him to be able to admit this lack of all rightness, he said, I'm either going to have to do what you're doing or I'm going to have to see a psychiatrist. I'm worried about myself. I was always doing people favors, being nice to people, trying to win their love. And in fact, I'd be extra nice because I knew if they ever really get to know me, they won't like me. You know, yeah. this, this whole fear thing that I was coming from. So he couldn't respect me. He couldn't. I couldn't respect myself. I couldn't get respect. And when I began to respect me, then I began to naturally expect it from other people. And if they didn't give it, that's all right. I mean, they don't know my worth, but that isn't my problem. I don't have to put out resentment 
about it. And it's intriguing to me that he recognized that change and noticed that it's working and said, I want it to. Whatever you're doing, I want to do it too. I found out it's all right to play. I found out it's all right to laugh and to do a lot of things that people don't think that adults are supposed to do. And playing is delightful for an adult to be able to, to wrestle, to joke, to laugh, to play, to play like children makes life a different kind of experience. And you start to live instead of making a living so that eventually you can live. I mean, you know, I'm going to live at 60, but I'm not going to wait until 60 to start. Live now and enjoy living because it's all right to do so. Because I love me. Me is a nice guy and I want him to be happy because I love him. And I know that if I do love him, he becomes more of a nice guy. He can do things for other people because he cares, because he loves them, because he knows that they are what I am. And people who receive kindness and love are kind and loving people. They return it. Generally, people who are capable of loving as adults are people who felt loved as children, which fairly well explains why there are not a lot of loving adults. There are very few children who feel loved. And you might examine this in your own relationship with your children because we tend to do a thing in our culture that says what you do is what you are. That's not true, but it's another one of the irrational beliefs of, these, of our culture. For example, when Tommy is bad, you say to him, you are a bad boy. You don't say you are a good and incredible and wonderful being and what you did there was inappropriate. It didn't work for you and it didn't work for me. But it doesn't make you a bad person. When we scold children for making mistakes, generally they feel unloved. And you have an enormous responsibility to separate making mistakes from being all right. In your relationship with your children, do your very best to make a separation there. You are all right. You have made a mistake. This mistake doesn't work for you. It doesn't make life better. It doesn't accomplish what you wanted to accomplish. In fact, you might notice how much your children do negative things to get attention. We even train them that way. Do you know you're trained? in the cradle even, to do negative things to get attention. Mark Twain wrote a fascinating essay on just this thing. Um, it's called something about the art of lying. And, um, and he says the first thing that a baby learns is to scream when he's jabbed with a pin. And then the adults, of course, soothe him and do wonderful things to him. So then he learns to scream when he's not being jabbed with a pin. He has learned to lie before he learns to talk. And essentially what Mark Twain is saying there is we learn to scream, we learn to express our displeasure in order to get stroked. And we learn that that's the way to do it. So what happens when you're two years old, when you're three years old? If a child wants your attention, he screams, he does something naughty. And what happens if he's being nice? He's ignored. What kind of relationship does that set up in our culture? I mean, what happens then when you're 20? Well, what happens when you're 20 is that when you want your wife's attention, you do something to get her to scream at you. And you got attention. You got noticed. But you don't feel that when I'm putting out the right things, when I'm doing the right things, that gets attention, that gets reward. We ignore the things that should be rewarded and we reward the things that should not be done at all. And it's a really backward kind of thing in our culture. Watch that on your own part. Watch what happens when you feel lonesome, when you feel a need for attention. Watch how the tendency is to become negative immediately. You may be alarmed when you discover that little bit in yourself. I've found it in me. If I start to feel 
lonesome, I start to feel depressed, I start to feel unnoticed. I notice that the first thing I do is fall silent, and then I have this look on my face, and everybody begins to look like, what's wrong? And of course, already it's working. As soon as they notice that, it's already working. It's a very effective technique, except I have to decide that's not the kind of attention that I want. What I really want is positive, loving, joyous attention. And the second I discover that, if I'm a master of my emotions, I can stop like that. I stop by deciding that's not what I want. I make a switch and then I begin to express something else. Let's have a ball. Let's do something together. Let's give each other attention. I want to be stroked. And there's something interesting about people at Carmel. They love to stroke, love to touch, love to be together. We give each other permission. When you can begin to do that in your family, and something else about children, just to be thrown in here, um, you maybe should become aware that in the United States, we are a culture that has, um, has forbidden touch a great deal. We don't do a lot of it in our, our culture. We're not demonstrative in that kind of way. But it has been discovered that children who are physically handled a lot in growing up will grow as much as two inches taller. You can make an enormous physical difference by touching, by handling. It is incredibly healing and it communicates this all rightness, this love and acceptance better than just words. It communicates it effectively. I do a lot of traveling overseas and uh, and of course, in England, there's even less touching than there is here. A little bit more on the continent, but boy, when you get into the Middle East, in Egypt, in Israel, in the Arab countries, you see two men walking down the street. They are never separated. They either are arm in arm, locked arms, or they are holding hands. Can you imagine two men walking down the street holding hands? They always do in Cairo. You wouldn't think of walking down the street with a friend without holding his hand. You touch. It's expected that you touch, or you have your arms around each other. And women, of course, do as well. And you don't see that much of a man and a woman holding hands unless they're married. I mean, that's because of the culture there. But there's a lot of touching, a lot of physical demonstration. If we can get a little more of that in our culture, we'll feel a little more all right with ourselves. Our children will grow up feeling loved. And a loved child makes a loving parent. So we want to heal relationships in this order. Heal relationship with self. Heal relationship with source. Heal relationship with parents. And when we do, we will automatically heal relationships with peers, with people around us, people that we work with. And heal relationships with children. It's so important, especially if you're going to ever be a parent, it is so vitally important to heal relationships with children. We do one of two things. We try to make them surrogate selves. We try to make them over to be what we feel that we weren't, which puts a ridiculous obligation on them. They can't do it. Or we come from an authority trip. How often have you seen parents manipulate children into a kind of behavior that is not designed for the child's best interest. It is only designed to prove the authority of the parent over the child. As in the case of this man that I was talking about, trying to force his son to sit down and shut up. That was only to establish his position of authority. And I see that with parents all the time. They are telling children to do something. You mind me, I'm an adult. And it's an ego trip, and it is your opportunity to prove that you have power over another individual. Children become ultimate victims in our culture to the power trips of adults. Adults are insulted if children don't do what they tell them to do. But that doesn't happen with a parent who is all right. If I'm all right, I don't need the proper uh, response from my children to make me an adequate adult. And be careful about this, parents, and consider some things that you probably ought to look at very well in your relationship with children. 
You have probably taught your children some lies about this culture. One of the things that we learn is that it is important to make good grades. And you may have pushed and, and argued and nagged and all of these things. If you're like my parents, you sure did. Nagging your children to make good grades. And you know what an interesting thing is? There is absolutely no provable relationship whatsoever between good grades in school and success in later life. Absolutely none. In fact, if you study it, you find that, I'll, that very often the obverse is true. Um, Edison and Einstein are two cases. Neither of them made good grades in school. Look what they did a little later in life. There is no relationship there. Why do children make good grades in school? Because their parents demand it. They do it to please parents. And they do it because they're forced to. They do it because that they believe that it is important and you can't establish an important... What is important then? It's important that children behave, right? That they be nice little adults especially in public, especially when other people can see who their mother is. Children behave well for their parents. And think about a well-behaved child. A well-behaved child, you can be absolutely certain, is a neurotic child. And if there are exceptions to that, they are rare. Well-behaved children are usually neurotic children, curbing their behavior to please another person because of the lack of their own all-rightness. Then what is a healthy child? A healthy child is a joyous, happy child who feels loved. He does not need to, be, uh, not, he does not need to misbehave to get attention, and he does not need to conform to be all right. He is neither well-behaved nor ill-behaved. He is a joyous, happy child being a youngster and doing the things that a youngster would do. Sometimes that's mischievous. Sometimes it's wonderful. All of the time, it is a joyous, happy, loved experience exploring an adventurous world. And if a child at that age finds that this world is an adventurous, wonderful place that teaches him a lot, and he can be curious about things instead of, don't touch that, don't reach for that, don't look into that, don't explore this. Instead, encourage everything that a child wants to know about the world around him. You may wind up with a few broken vases. What is a broken vase to a wonderful, happy child a little bit later in life? Let them explore. Don't refuse to let them to reach out into the world around them. Don't, don't refuse to let them find out. Because by encouraging an inquisitive mind, you teach a child to learn. Now, please be aware that schools do not teach children to learn. Schools teach you what to know, not how to know. And what we need are people who know how to find out how to gather information. If you want them to become people who know, who experience and express, who find out about the world, curious minds, inquisitive minds, minds that grow, then encourage curious children that are finding out about the world around them and find it an adventurous, wonderful place, not a threatening, hostile, awful place. A child who grew up feeling that the world was hostile and awful and challenging is an adult who is surrounded with fear afraid of the world around them, and is passing that on to a new generation. That fear and hostility. Um, the sixth relationship that is what we're going to call the ultimate relationship. The ultimate relationship is a combination of all of the above relationships. The interesting thing is that it has no choice. The ultimate relationship has no choice but to be a reflection of all of these. If there is anything wrong with any of these, it will be reflected in this ultimate relationship. And what I'm calling the ultimate relationship here is your love relationship with husband, wife, or partner in life. 
And why am I calling that the ultimate relationship? I have said up here that this is the vital one. All others are a result of it. This is a result of it. The reason I'm calling it the ultimate relationship is because this is the one that reflects all others. This is the one that causes all others. You'll find out about your relationship with God through your relationship with your partner in life. You'll find out about your relationship with your parents through that. It will come out. You'll find out about your relationship with your peers. You'll take it out here. Your relationship with children. All other relationships are reflected in this love relationship because the person that you partner with in life, having a marriage relationship, reflects all of your values. This is the person who can teach you most about yourself. And it is the person who is your ultimate teacher, your best opportunity for growth, um, your best barometer for growth to tell you where you are in that relationship. When you build a love relationship, make that a very sacred relationship. Watch that person. They'll tell you everything that is wrong with yourself. And they won't tell you anything about themselves, not until you have outgrown that. When you grow to be a very whole person, then you can look at them, but you'll look at them sympathetically, you'll see their symptoms. Until then, when you look at them, you're going to see only a reflection of you. All of the things that you think are wrong with them are things that they're telling you about yourself. They're saying, this is what hurts you. This is what you're afraid of. This is what frustrates you. That person is so valuable to you. It's fascinating. That's the person who can help you more than any other. That's why we're calling it an ultimate relationship. It reflects all others. That person is the ultimate agent of your teacher. Now, the usual thing to do with that person, if they are terribly effective, we divorce them so that we can find another one just like them to tell us the same things. Because when I have these things wrong with me, no matter what relationship I set up, I am going to find these things reflected in it. Before you divorce somebody, before you change your relationship with somebody, make that relationship all right. When you come to the point where you could live with it, then you're ready to make a decision to live without it if you want to change it. But first, make sure that you can live in that in a supportive way. You can still be all right with yourself. Don't ever say, I would be happy if. Be happy first, and then you can do the if because you're happy. You've taken responsibility for self. And that is the ultimate source of relationships, getting that all rightness with self.